the particular mission is, is the easy one, conserve the fighting force. <laughs> and so that's our overall mission. So how do you conserve the fighting force? What I was trying to convey was we have very many different aspects to do that. And we have to involve the command, we have to involve the family, we have to involve the child, we have to involve all the different services that I have and to integrate them together so we're not doing redundancy, so we're not doing uh, conflicting. So to make sure also that readiness is, is a portion of that. I mean, I mean everything. We have anything from depression, PTSD, we have suicides, we have homicides, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a slice of society, you know. Uh, we're, we're a combat brigade, we're not a training brigade, and so we don't have uh, the trainees, the basic trainees and the things like that. So everybody is there for war fighting or, you know, supporting the war fighter. Well, the biggest one is the choke point. I mean, so the biggest one, no visibility. Uh, only having one or two ways, which is basically go through primary care or the ER to access behavioral health care, you know? And it totally shut out the command. So it shut out the command from getting that information. So when we talked about the white space and we talked about the, the, the biggest area that can affect the soldier, which is the family and the commander, uh, if I've cut out that particular piece, then I am really not doing anything to help the soldier, you know? Uh, Prozac or Zoloft is not going to cut it if I can't get the command on board. The major advantage of the embedded model is increased access, increased visibility, increased trends and outcomes me measurements, increased command liaison for a better outcome for the soldier and for readiness. And so it also creates a very good uh, focal point to get them into all the subspecialties, be it inpatient, intensive outpatient, uh, psychological testing. So all of those things that that were a, a, a gate or a barrier before, now they have instant access to. And it's in the footprint, so you see a huge stigma uh, reduced as well. Well, the biggest one is the embedded behavioral health teams. So to take a 13-person team, to dedicate them to one combat brigade. And so within that 13-person team, there's seven providers, six or each are aligned with a battalion, okay? So you'll have one provider, a psychologist or social worker assigned with a battalion, and then one med provider, so seven. And the rest are ancillary support, um, not only SSAs, like master levels, to help with counseling and coordination, nurse case managers, and you know, the the MSAs and the medical assistants and stuff. And so uh, that 13-person team, it's a huge different uh, model to say that, okay, now it used to be one organic behavioral health officer per brigade, 3,000 people. Now I'm putting 13 people there to all do behavioral health. And that's a huge shift. It's a huge hit on resources, but it then also puts the emphasis, this is what's important. Take care of our soldiers, take care of their families, and then take care of the mission. Uh, the other things at Fort Carson are the child and adolescent family and the school-based behavioral health. So still it's that embedding within there, uh, the school-based, and making the child and adolescent a very subspecialty now integrated within, I guess the best way to say is it, within primary behavioral health care. So okay. all three of those things um, as a test site, that's what's happening in Fort Carson. Well, that, that would be the buy-in, you know. So the, the command really wants to talk to another we call green suitor. They're ACUs, they're kind of brownish and stuff, but that's an old term. But they want to discuss things with another active duty. And so uh, the uniform and, and the active duty can get you in the door, but you still have to perform these embedded behavior health teams because they consistently perform and they consistently show that we are an asset to the command, they get the buy-in that way. So the barrier is the initial buy-in. It takes a little bit longer for a civilian to earn the trust of a commander than it would be if I just walked in the room. 
uh, I think that allowing for innovation and flexibility, not standardizing quite everything, so you allow for that innovation and creativity, supporting my, you know, my clinicians on the ground, I mean, to, to really get a good, robust workforce, okay, to have the funding available to do innovative things and to actually kind of measure them. I mean, those are the, going to be the, the most successful ways where we're going to take care of the soldiers. Um, you know, and I, I, I think that I'm really blessed with a lot of good people.